Hello and welcome to the 18th edition of the India Business Leader Awards. I'm Shireen Bhan. We are here today to recognize and honor the achievers of India Inc. Men and women who have managed global volatility, domestic challenges to emerge as high performers, high achievers. You will have to wait till we reveal those names, but today was the day that the India Business Leader Awards jury deliberated on who will walk away with the honors. But today is also the day where we have seen the RBI, the MPC, deliver its credit policy. We had the budget being announced as well. So two big economic events are off the calendar. And this is, of course, the start of 2023. So to get a sense of what the road from resilience to resurgence will look like, what need to be the actionables uh, on the road ahead, joining me now is the jury of the India Business Leader Awards. Ladies and gentlemen, many, many thanks for joining us here today. Uday Kotak, to you first, sir. Let me start by asking you about what you made of the commentary that came in from the Reserve Bank Governor. Do you expect a pause or do you expect the tightening to continue? Uh, Shireen, I think the policy was on expected lines, but probably the feeling was that it was a little more hawkish than what the market would have expected. And it follows the Fed Chair's interview last night which again was perceived a little more hawkish than what the market expected. And you saw the U.S. 10-year rates go back to 364. Uh, and uh, here as well, I think withdrawal of accommodation continues. There was some expectation in some market participants that we would move to neutral. And also the inflation projections for FY24, last quarter of March 2024, is still predicting uh, an estimate of inflation at 5.6% for that last quarter. Therefore, 6.5 is roughly about 90 basis points higher than the expectation one year later. Therefore, my personal view is it remains 6.5 for a while. I don't think we see reduction in interest rates. And then... Further tightening, though? I think, uh, you, have to, I think you have to follow what the RBI says. At the next meeting, they will say they are data dependent. <laughs> Well, let, let's get a quick dipstick survey here. We've got the top bankers of the country here with us, Mr. Kara. What do you make of it? Do you also think that it was more hawkish than what was estimated? I do tend to agree with Dude, but uh, at the same time, I think we are all expected that 25 basis point increase will be there. It was already factored by the market. Uh, I would say that the kind of enablers which they have put in now in terms of, you know, uh, when it comes to uses of UPI, even the international players who are coming, mm. international tourist traffic, they can also use UPI when they are coming into the country. Apart from that, security is borrowing and lending, more so for the mutual funds and the insurance company, will make this particular market more deeper, which was the need of the hour. And I would say that, uh, yes, uh, as far as the penal interests are concerned, there will be more order in the industry. So I think these are some of the some of the positives which probably will uh, lead the industry and the economy to the much mature stage. Okay, so we'll come to the positives in just a second, but Zareen, uh, uh, what do you make of it? A pause from here on or do you believe that the tightening is likely to continue? I, I would agree with Uday. I think uh, the tone was much more uh, hawkish than what the market expected and I think uh, some statements that suggest that they're still worried about core inflation. And I think the non-farm payroll data also of U.S., that has also surprised a lot of people. And with dollar strengthening, and to defend the rupee also, I think the interest rate uh, hike is something that could be possible. Mm -hmm. uh, could, could be possible. Which camp do you belong to, Vedinathan? <laughs> well, three of them have spoken, so I don't want to add much to it. But I can just say that uh, the uh, fundamental drivers that is driving the economy in terms of being underserved and, uh, you know, uh, the digitization, uh, massive movement on that, all that will keep moving the economy. And frankly, whether interest rate is this or 20 bps below or above, as long as the economy is continuing to climb at 7% per year or, or real, real rates, I think we're all good. Are we all as good, Sanjeev Mehta, as uh, we hope that we're going to be, especially in terms of consumption, as rates continue to move higher? The RBI governor did allude to the fact that core inflation continues to be very sticky. Uh, you know, what's the impact likely to be on consumption and what do you sense from here on? You know, the rate of inflation will go down. But if we really have to give a fillip to consumption as in volume growth, 
then we have to see commodity prices go down substantially, which would then result in corporations like ours passing the benefit to the consumers. Then the consumption would come back. And you're not at that oh, point? We aren't at that stage. Save and accept a commodity or two like the palm oil, where the prices have gone down and the companies have passed on the benefit to the consumers. In rest of it, they are significantly ahead of, say, the 10-year median. Or if you compare to, say, 2020, many of the prices are at double the rate of what this was two years back. Mm. So you, while you might not be able to do price cuts, do you need to hike prices any further at this point in time? The rate of price hike would be substantially lower. But what you would see in the price growth would first be coming in from the price increases that were taken in the second half of the last year. Mm -hmm. So since we're talking about consumption and we're talking about prices, TV Narendran, let me ask you, uh, you know, the big X factor in all of this is, of course, what China does and what that is going to mean as far as commodity prices are concerned. We've started to see some visible impact of that. What's the expectation? I think uh, that's the elephant in the room. China is expected to come back more strongly than most people thought. Let's wait and see over the next few weeks because there's a lot of pent-up consumption in China. Just like we saw in India because of COVID restrictions, a lot of consumption didn't happen. If you see what's happening in China over the last few weeks, travel is, uh, you know, really moving, not just for Lunar New Year. There are a lot of people coming into China, traveling out of China. So there are a lot of uh, parts of the Chinese economy which are expected to rebound because of uh, the COVID restrictions being removed. Secondly, I think they have done a good job of fixing most of the property issues that they dealt with, that they had. And so if China comes back strongly, if you really look at what triggered inflation a few years back, mm. it was a post-COVID recovery and supply chains couldn't keep up. I think supply chains have got fixed a lot, but the recovery in China could be uh, something which drives inflation back again. Well, you know, how much is it likely to drive prices higher? That's good news for you, so you will have a bigger smile on your well, face. But, uh, but how much is it likely to move prices higher by? What's no, the expectation? So, Shireen, it's yes and no for us because uh, we are also a buyer of commodities like coal. Uh, so we are watchful. We are also watching energy prices, gas prices, all that impacts our cost. Uh, but uh, if you look at the commodity I represent steel, prices have gone up over 10, 15 percent in the last yeah. Well, Anish, consumption, uh, this was the big sort of budget that tried to do its part as far as CapEx was concerned, credit and consumption. Uh, you know, at this point in time, what's the outlook really as far as consumption is concerned? We are seeing very strong consumption across all our sectors. In auto, it's driven by products that we have. Surprisingly, the farm sector has held up very well. And the growth in farm equipment, in tractors in particular, has been far higher than what we've expected this mm. year. Uh, and that augurs well for India overall. And as we see across other sectors in hospitality, in logistics, in real estate, we're continuing to see very high demand. Uh, and uh, that that's really hadn't hasn't calmed down. So, yet. you know, this is what I want to link. Uh, uh, Sanjeev Mehta, I want you to come in on this. Here's Anisha saying that actually rural demand as far as their tractor segment is concerned has been very, very strong. But that hasn't been the case as far as FMCG is concerned. How do the two then reconcile? Yeah, there is a fundamental difference. Tractors are not owned by farm hands. Farm hands consumption is driven by wages. Yeah, and uh, it is not that the growth is not there. If you look at the full year 22, we are still talking about the top line or the headline growth still being positive even in rural India. But for the kind of price increase we have seen, which has been unprecedented, it's also not surprising that the consumers have titrated the volume. Mm. Uh, Prabha, and I want to come to you on that. You know, what are the trends that you're seeing? Because there was a lot of expectation on what it would mean in terms of down trading and so on and so forth. Many companies have, in fact, innovated as far as pack sizes are concerned just to be able to beat inflation. Uh, what are you seeing at this point in time and how are you mitigating some of these risks? So what we're seeing actually is very similar to what Mr. Mehta said in terms of the rural consumption not coming back as fast and certainly amongst the rural poor we are seeing consumption being under serious pressure, particularly in categories that are not seen as fully essential and a choice can be made. What we are seeing at the other end of the spectrum is premium urban consumers are actually driving market demand and premiumization continues to grow apace. So it's kind of like a two-phased market. And in terms of pack sizes and down trading, we're not seeing any significant shift as yet, more just a curtailment of consumption where money is tight and wages are not coming back to meet the inflation 
the inflation that's happening in the in their baskets but it will come and there is we are seeing a little bit of green shoots so hopefully it will come as we go on and obviously there is always more opportunity at the premiumization end of the spectrum as far as india is concerned absolutely mr kotak i want to address uh, one of the challenges that we could potentially face and link that to what is happening globally and you did allude uh, to that in your tweet while i think there is consensus that at this point in time the risks uh, domestically are few and far between the risks globally are the ones that we need to brace ourselves for you talked about the foreign debt aspect and how that makes some companies perhaps more vulnerable and that's what i wanted to understand if the indian banking system doesn't have a systemic risk at this point in time what are some of the global challenges that you are worried about see i think uh, and i see a lot of corporates here uh, they should be borrowing more from indian financial institutions <laughs> they're borrowing too much from outside and I'm, i'm sure my banking colleagues will agree with us mr khara you want to you want to come in on that as well <laughs> <laughs> no i think market uh, is probably guiding them to borrow more from the indian market no <laughs> global market and, and i i i believe that uh, and i'm not going into any specifics i think this is a time for indian financial sector to build its capacity both in terms of underwriting skills as well as scale and i do not believe global financiers necessarily have better underwriting skills but india has to hone it and its own financial sector should be able to do thorough diligence and get its underwriting right if we do that and we need to build a whole host of capacities in india so that corporates feel that the first port of call is to borrow from mm. india and the risks of global borrowing is that a person sitting in new york london zurich hong kong beijing wherever may not understand the indian dynamics as well and is very much focused and impacted by media reports globally mm. and decisions can be taken more superficially without going necessarily into the facts of the case mm. uh, you know just wanted to take that point forward uh, you said the decisions can be taken based on headlines so to speak in a superficial assessment of those headlines as opposed to a deeper understanding of the dynamics what's the risk of that at this point in time do you believe that there is a outflow risk or a india premium being cut risk at this point see i've had chats with many investors and you know investors are like different animals in a jungle each have a different strategy so there are a set of investors which are saying top down india getting carried away by the headlines but there are many bottom up and smart investors who are asking the question which is deeper that how are indian company valuations and will this give us an opportunity to invest and of course the most common comparison is oh china is much cheaper than india hmm. and therefore they are looking at relative valuations but they are looking for value therefore investors play different games and different investors are different you cannot have one size yep. colors all and for every seller there could be another global investor who says it's a great buy time